Welcome back to Brutifully Made. Today, I want to talk a little bit about multidisciplinary artists and calling yourself one. How do you define that? Is it just an interest in different ways of one medium, like painting? Or is it that you're interested in different types of art? Maybe you love to do sculpture, and maybe you like to paint, and maybe you like to do fiber arts. What does that mean? How do you define it? And do you have to be professional in every level? Do you have to make money at every level? And really just my thoughts around um, what that means to me and how I define myself. So maybe that will help you a little bit in your journey. Thanks for joining me today. Hey, happy Friday. Welcome back to Brutifully Made. I'm excited about talking to you today about multidisciplinary, um, really in the vein of uh, being a creative person. It seems like there's a lot of, I guess, discussion in some of the circles that I'm in about having that as a descriptive in your bio. And if that's okay, or do you have to stick with one medium? And I have lots of thoughts on that. So let's first pick the doodle that I'm going to do today. And maybe you'll doodle along with me. If you do use the hashtag brutifully made on social media, I do try to search for those to see if anybody is doodling along with me. So today, let's see what one to draw selects. Looks like a mummy as a model. <laughs> How fun. Oh, good. It's another uh, opportunity for me to do something that doesn't need to be super realistic. <laughs> That's my specialty. <laughs> so let's get started with doodling and talking about um, being interested in different types of um, endeavors. So I really started kind of using that descriptive multidisciplinary a lot this year. I have an interest in so many different things. I love to do painting in traditional ways. Um, of course, my murals, um, I do uh, that on all kinds of surfaces. I've painted on brick. I've painted on um, just drywall. I've painted on some really cool boards that they've installed so they could take the paintings down and move them around. Um, it really makes you think about what you're going to use for a medium. I've used in house paint, primer included, uh, acrylics, um, just really tried to make it last. And uh, sometimes I'll have to prep the materials. Sometimes I don't because it's just a surface that I can paint right on. And the materials that I'm using, it has uh, the primer or something that's going to help it last a lot longer already in it. But I've also not really had a whole lot of practice with some of the other, um, I guess, paint materials. And there are so many out there. Like I have never really taken a super in-depth watercolor class. I've done a couple watercolor classes online and I loved it. And it's just so freeing to try your hand at something and realize that you really can't control it. So it has to be its course. Like you can't control everything. I've taken some of those courses online and um, I really like to take some in person. I know that's a museum here in town they offer quite a few different options and opportunities so I really want to do that eventually another thing that I dove into this year that I've never really taken a class in uh other than again online I did a lot of windowsill workshops so um I love that podcast and I love being part of Margot's Patreon and she offered all of these different workshops for almost, well, over a year. And they had different artists presenting different lessons. And I did printmaking and I did paper art. And um, I remember wanting to get gouache paint, but I didn't know how to pronounce it. 
So I was so intimidated to go to an art store and ask for it because I didn't know how to say it and I didn't want to look like an idiot. (laughs) And I'm just going to be totally transparent. That's one of the reasons I never did it because I didn't know how to say it pay it. And I don't know why I just didn't look it up to figure out how do you say gouache and how do you use the materials? Because I I think I painted on, um, it was a canvas or something and it started to peel off. And I'm like, I have no idea what I'm doing, but I just practiced and played with it and tried it on different substrates and materials. And That's just kind of what you have to do. So you don't have to be professional 100% in every medium that you try, but you can still be interested in it. So I just think I had to share that because (laughs) I just, I get intimidated by not knowing everything ahead of time. And I know I'm not alone in doing that. But um, I also love fiber art and sewing. I love to sew. I have sewed for decades. I used to make so many dresses and clothes for my daughters growing up, um, matching things, mother-daughter dresses, their doll clothes. Um, Oh my gosh, I did so many weddings (laughs) of bridesmaids' dresses and veils and oh my gosh, just, I can't even, uh, quilts and just sewing, 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 sewing. So for years I've on like my fifth machine. Um, just love, I love sewing. I love fiber art. I do not know how to crochet and I do not know how to knit. I had a, uh, I have a friend, Susan, God love you, Susan Farley. (laughs) She came over and I think we spent like six hours. She's trying to teach me how to crochet. I made this huge lunch and we had just the best time outside (laughs) in the gazebo trying to teach me how to crochet. And um, she's so good at it. And I wish I could do it. I want to like be able to look at a pattern and know what those words mean as you go along. And I'm just so envious of like everyone who started to do that at a young age with like grandparents, because I think that's where so many people say, yeah, I learned how to sew for, or crochet from my grandmother or my aunt. And they can do it so fast and just make whatever. I love that. I just think that's just, fascinating. And, uh, I love that Susan still, uh, I'll send her patterns and pictures constantly now and like, Hey, look at this, look at this jewelry. I mean, there's so many beautiful things with crocheting and knitting. I I just no idea. I have a knitting machine. I got one of the circle knitters that you put the yarn in and you rotate it with, or you turn the handle and you can knit a hat really fast. And, uh, I use the drill to make it go quicker. And I was like, Oh, I'm going to burn this thing up and break it (laughs) because it was so cool. I was making hats and sending them to like my granddaughters, my daughters, my mom. (laughs) It was a lot of fun. And I still have that and, you know, got the pom-poms for the top and stuff. So that's a lot of fun. I like doing that. I just love yarn. I love the texture of it and the feel of it, the colors. I just, I fascinated by that. So I, I still want to take lessons to learn how to do that. Um, I love paper art. I love paper. I love the the heaviness of paper, the colors that it comes in. I love tearing it and cutting it, layering it. Um, it's just beautiful painting on it and then using that. I know Tracy English is one of my favorite paper artists just because I love how she takes all the textures and paints on it and then makes these beautiful collages and pictures and just there's darling. And so I love seeing her work and, um, taking a class with her and it was just, just fabulous. It's just so pretty. And I just have such a great interest in that and just, um, love and appreciate all the work that goes into that. And I think there's a paper cutting technique. I'm going to, I'm going to mess up this name, like a or something like that. It's Swedish. Um, but you use the really teeny tiny fine scissors and you do paper cutting. My mother saw something on like PBS decades ago and loved that. And I remember paper cutting a, um, I think it was a Noah's Ark uh, for her years ago in that kind of technique. And it's because 
it gave her validation when she saw how they were holding the scissors. And we both hold scissors in a weird way. I learned from my mother because that's the only way she knew how to cut. And so when I was little and in art class, I would get yelled at for holding my scissors wrong. And I remember my mom going into like the parent teacher conferences and the art teacher like reprimanding her for teaching me how to hold scissors backwards and my mom was like well that's how I hold them that's the only way I know how to show her and I think I was like five five or six this was very very young and so it wasn't until college that I tried to hold scissors I guess the right way the regular way where they're pointing outward and my mother saw these two sisters on this show paper cutting and they held their scissors like she did and she was like Tracy oh my gosh they're holding their scissors like like we do and so now I can hold them both ways but it's just it's a I'll have to like take a picture (laughs) I do it and um but yeah it's it was just a way that I always held my scissors because that's the way my mother you know held hers and that's how she taught me but um but yeah I can remember being um reprimanded quite often for for holding my scissors incorrectly and it's just amazing thinking back into the 70s and 80s on how things had to be a certain way to be considered correct and that if you were going to be an artist you know you needed to do it this way and there wasn't like this mindset of being able to do it your way to me that's just how I felt I also grew up in Appalachia so it's I don't know, maybe that was a mindset that they were worried that, you know, you had to follow along maybe some bigger ideals and things from other areas and not really hold on to like your spin on it. I don't, I don't know. But, um, but yeah, so I, again, I think I had talked about earlier how I loved making paper dolls and, and I used to draw faces all the time and like compare them against one another and which one looked prettier and which one was funnier. And I like didn't even think about them being different emotions and stuff like that. But it was just, you know, how curly was this one's hair? How straight was this one's hair? Did this one have bangs? You know, uh, uh, their eye shapes and just uh, I would draw for hours and hours and hours like that. And so I loved drawing and sketching. And I can remember taking those classes in college for the first time. And one of the first critiques that I got um, was to stop using the edges of the paper as a frame to draw past that. And it never had occurred to me. It It was like it had to stay either centered or like right in the middle. I just I was so regimen regimented <laughs> to think that everything had to fit instead of thinking, what if it expanded? outside those edges, pretend that you're very close up to it. And it was really hard for me to think like that for a very, very long time. And it was just fascinating to me to see other artists from other schools that had come from different states and even in the same state, but watching their work and like, that's how they were told to think freely and I just never had that instruction. And it was just like, oh my gosh, I didn't know that you could break that rule. I thought that was a hard rule. Hey, I don't feel that I am alone in my creative journey in exploring different methods uh, of creating. And I would love to have you as a guest on the program just to talk about what you are interested in and how you are creating your dreams. And it doesn't have to be an art creative career. It could be a small business. It could be anything that you have put your life into and your goals are something that are your dreams. So just send me a message. I would love to have some guests on. I already have a list running of people I'm contacting. But if any of this sounds like a great time for you to doodle along with me, I won't make you do it if you don't want to, but I think it would be fun if you did. And just chat and talk about how you're achieving those goals. Uh, Send me a message. Thanks a lot. My mom still may have it. I don't think she does, but I can just remember making um, oversized pieces. Like I made the shoes that I had worn to prom and they were like two feet 
long and it was ginormous. And I just loved thinking that I could do that with clay and, you know, firing it and then, you know, glazing it and learning about glazes and Raku was my favorite. I just loved that sheen and the way that it changed, you know, color and the way that you held it and, and just, you know, never got to do that in high school. That was a college thing. And, uh, just, you know, loved, just loved that texture and getting to build something by hand. And that was, that was a lot of fun. I, I have a great appreciation for that. I don't do that on a regular basis at all. I do little sculpture, tiny little things and love building things with wood. And, and, and I love working with my laser and that kind of just blended into my graphic work. Cause I love doing, um, digital drawing and I love procreate and I love the ability to use the pen as different brushes. And so there's so many cool different textures and things that you can replicate. And I, I just think that that's so much fun digitally. And it really saved a huge step for me because I was taking pictures of my paintings and then bringing them in into Photoshop and, you know, being able to print them from that. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm saving, I'm saving an entire step. I can draw this natively as a digital file and now I can print it or I can have it put on merchandise and and when I design a mural, I don't have to sketch it out and use color pencil and marker. I can do it digitally and then I can superimpose it onto the wall or the item and they can really see what it's going to look like. And that was a huge game changer for me. I love that. And it just, you know, opened up a whole other world, but that medium alone is so much fun. I love doing that. And, um, I love being able to think about all of the different ways that I love to create and turning them into something that I can share for someone to also enjoy. So if you think about the different ways that you like to make something and expanding on how it's traditionally used, like I was talking about fiber art and always sending my friend Susan like jewelry and everybody thinks of crocheting as sweaters and stuff, but I've been finding these beautiful like necklaces and patterns for earrings and headbands and all of these things that are in crochet, like granny squares. It's not just an Afghan anymore. I have so many cardigans and sweaters and I would send them like, you got to make these and sell these because they're like one of my favorite things. They're just beautiful. And, and she's like, She's like, I didn't even think about it being past an Afghan or a blanket. And people love wearing, you know, yarn items. So uh, past like a, I guess, traditional sweater. So I just, I think if you also look at um, wrapping paper and um, cards, and if you have that work done and you do a really beautiful photo of it, you can take that and put that as a repeat pattern on all kinds of things. You can print the knit in the crochet design on tote bags and, and like I said, cards and journals, and it's so pretty and you get to share it that way too. So I think if you have an interest in different types of art, think of different ways that you can share it and in and really diversify your portfolio too, because I think that a lot of people think, okay, I only like to do sculpture, but sculpture can translate into beautiful photography and it can be placed on items. It can inspire a repeat pattern. I mean, a beautiful piece of sculpture, you know, take that into a digital format, repeat it and put it on a really pretty texture background. I, I would wear that as a dress or a shirt. I mean, that would be amazing. You know, just don't think of it as the only, um, I guess, substrate or, or item that you're making. And that's the only way that you can use it. There's lots and lots of different ways that you can take your work and, and really offer it in a variety of ways for people to enjoy it. You know, I might not be able to buy a $5,000 um, piece of pottery, but if I have it as a note card and they're thank you cards that I can frame or share with friends, I can buy a pack of those and uh, get to enjoy seeing it and looking at it just as much. 
if I didn't have the $5,000 to buy it. So it's, it's, you know, think about different ways that you can, you know, share all of your interests and, uh, different, I, I think about, like I talked about Tracy's work, um, she'll put it on tea towels and calendars and, you know, of course her cards, but, and then make stories. And it's wonderful that she's, you know, okay, I've got this one piece with this beautiful paper, you know, collage on it, but offering it in different, different cute ways to enjoy on a pillow as a throw, um, a puzzle, just it's think about different ways that you can share, share that work. And it's okay to be interested in all sorts. You, you know, if you're a painter, you don't have to just stick with acrylics. You know, you can try oils. I've taken one oil class painting and it was also this year and it was like a Bob Ross style painting uh, class. And it was so much fun. I had never done that before. And we had a blast. There was, I don't know, 10 of us. I don't even think it was 10. And it was done by a local artist. I'll find her name and put it in the show notes because she is certified to teach uh, the Bob Ross style. And it was so much fun. And I just had a blast. That was organized by a friend, uh, Dave Shrell. His uh, little handle on Instagram and everything is uh, Dave Ruins Art. And I say a little, this, this man, this guy, I swear, he um, has been featured all over in Newsweek and Board Panda. He takes some um, thrifted art and creates amazing, fun, like pop culture pieces from it. And he takes his pieces and makes, I've got magnets. Now he had this black velvet art with like horror pictures um, drawn on it. And I did this recycled jewelry box and I put his little magnets um that he created from his art. Uh, his calendars, um, just awesome. Mel, his wife, another phenomenal fiber artist. She does crocheting. Oh my gosh, she has knit hats. She has animals. I just got this cutest chicken nugget from her. And it reminded me of when my kids were little and I had to make a felt outfit for the chicken nugget <laughs> because I love working with felt and I'm like, I love her pieces. I told her, I'm like, I need like five more of these because I want to do the whole series of when my kids were little, they had the chicken nuggets from the Happy Meals that were Halloween dressed. And I had to like make the little pumpkin one, but now I want to do the rest. And I'm serious, Mel, I need, I need like five more. <laughs> I really want to do this, but um, I'll link all of these artists and all the classes um, or ways to take the classes uh, in the show notes because it's important to learn other mediums. You never know what you're going to fall in love with. You never know what's going to spark an interest to continue down a path, doing something with a new tool or a new um, medium. And it's totally okay to explore that. And it really expands your style and it really expands your knowledge and you learn so, so much. And don't be afraid. Don't don't be like me and not do something because you're too embarrassed to figure out how in the world to say something correctly. Um, it's totally okay to watch it. Um, just try, laugh it off and, and not be so concerned that you have to know how to do it 110% before you can dive in. That's the beauty of learning something new and having interests in all of these different forms of art. It's, it's freeing. And you have permission. You have my permission to try it. <laughs> Not that you need it. But us as artists always seem to talk about, well, I just I never knew I could do that. Who in the world? Why are we waiting on someone to give us permission to do something? I don't understand where that comes from. It's, it's totally okay to try. I mean, the first thing that you do is never going to be a masterpiece ever. It's just not. And that's the beauty of like when you're little growing up and you're learning how to do something and everyone's like, yay, you tried. If you need that pat on the back, tag me, let me know that you're trying something for the first time. You know, you're going to get that. Yay. You tried, you did it. You jumped in, you said it wrong, but you tried anyway. You are going to get that from me because I am right there with you. There are tons of things 
that um, I still want to learn how to do, still trying to learn how to do, still taking classes to learn how to do. Um, And it's totally okay to not do them perfectly. I mean, perfect is underrated. Nobody wants perfect. Nobody wants it to be like this flawless thing. Who can relate to that? Who can relate to something being flawless? And, you know, just, I don't ever want to feel like there's a threshold that I'm going to hit. And that is it. There's, there's no fun in that. Where's the beauty in that? It just, that, that means it's done. I don't want it to be done. I want it to continue. I just, you know, there's, there's no, there's no fun in perfection. You know, you just don't feel, I don't know. There's not a sense of accomplishment when it's like exactly right. I can look at something and I'm like, man, I could have done a little bit more now that I, you know, stepped away and that's okay. That's totally okay. Nothing has to be a hundred percent. We're never going to be a hundred percent. At the end of our lives, it's not like, oh, that was it. The, you know, she achieved everything. <laughs> it's, a, a, you know, there's always going to be like, man, really wish that person was still around because there's so much more that they can do. It's not like, oh, that was it. That was, that was their limit. It, you know, there's always more that you could have said. There's always more that you could have done. And I think you need to look at everything like that because, it makes it exciting to try a little bit different spin or approach it another way. And don't, don't get rid of things that you're working on. You fail at something. Don't toss it. Don't throw it away. Don't, you know, uh, destroy it. Just put it aside for a little bit. Don't, you know, don't do that. Go back and look at it and see how far you've come and see maybe how differently you would approach it and, you know, do it again. But just, you know, use those as guides and measuring sticks and, and really think about, man, this is a big change. I look at, I still have my portfolio from college and I look back at some of the assignments and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is, this is so raw from where I was. And I look what I didn't know and look where I, what I know now and look what I'm still learning. And that's, that's the beauty. I remember doing pen and ink and uh, had never had other than calligraphy class, having to learn how to control that and doing all the hash marks to control like shading. And it was just so cool to um, try those different pens and then micron pens. I love micron pens. And I remember wow, I don't have to carry around ink and you can just use these. And there's all different types of, you know, tips and compared to like the nibs that you would use with the pen and ink and just, again, there, I can just go through charcoal and pastels and chalk and different pencil hardnesses. And just, that's, that's one of the things I miss around here. We have no dedicated art store anymore. And I would just go in there and it's like, oh, I want to know how to airbrush. Oh my gosh, look at all of these colors. I'm just working with golden paints right now. These I've worked with acrylics. Of course, it was always the, just the inexpensive acrylics that you could get. Never knew. Golden's been around for a hundred years, I think. Never knew about these paints. Never had got to practice with them. Never got to mix something that's got such heavy pigment. I'm blown away. I have no clue that this was available and just what a game changer and learning how to paint a little bit more freely and abstractly. And that is totally something that is new to me. So I just feel, feel like there's no reason in the world for you to not try something new. And there's no reason in the world that you can't be known as a multidisciplinary artist as well. So be interested in painting and sculpting and drawing and sketching and digital art and fiber art and recycled art and metal art and jewelry and everything. Share with me what art that you love to do. Share with me what you like to paint on. I just, I love learning. If there's classes out there, I'd love to know about them. I really think that you have to continue to explore. Don't fear 
that unknown or the unpronounceable <laughs> like me. So I hope you enjoyed uh, the mummy as a model. And uh, thanks for listening to me this week. And I'd love to know what you work in, what mediums you work in and the classes that you take and what you've enjoyed and how you are sharing your work with others. And if you're too afraid to share your work, work with others, stop being afraid, share it, share pictures. I don't care if you don't think it's good enough. It's good enough. It absolutely is good enough. The world needs more of that. They need to see your work and you be brave because it's brutally made. I'll see you next time. Talk to you next time. Thanks for listening. Subscribe every week. <laughs> Take care. Bye. I so appreciate you tuning in today. Please subscribe. Leave me some feedback. I hope you enjoy the program. Just getting to talk a little bit about um, creative journeys. I'm excited to have some guests on soon. And I appreciate if you take a look at the show notes and there's all kinds of great information from the classes that I've taken, the people I mentioned, and just want to always, you know, collaborate and share all the information that I have in case it's something new to you. So have a great weekend. See you next time.